right. Juliet Terry here, part of the Dunchurch Agricultural Society and the Grassroots Growth Initiative. Welcome to the first grassroots grassroots growth initiative seminar, which is Garden Dreaming with Catalogs and Planning Your Garden. We are so pleased to have been awarded grant funding through OMAFRA's Grassroots Growth Initiative Program. The Dunchurch Agricultural Society has partnered with the Whitestone Library and Technology Center to build raised beds and provide educational seminars on many aspects of gardening here in West Perry Sound. We will also benefit from funding and support through the Georgian Bay Biosphere on additional seminars and we are working in cooperation with the Prairie Sound Friendship Center to spread out our reach. Our efforts are to support food security and environmental stewardship in support of the land. Next slide. So there are 10 different plant hardiness zones within Canada. And these zones are based on the average climate conditions of each area and is an excellent starting point if you are wondering if a particular plant will overwinter, which means surviving the coolest temperatures in your area. We are a zone four with zone three possibilities. Knowing this helps choose plants for success. Anything higher than a zone four means it needs special care to come inside for the winter. As well as using this map for reference, we recommend consulting other gardeners who have hands-on experience of weather and gardening patterns in your area. And we've lined up Libby Ipsen, Jane Bottrell, and Beth Gorham Matthews to share their experiences over the years and things that they have done to improve their chances at success in gardening. Along with the year-to-year -year variations in weather, microclimates can also place a role in determining the right plants for your garden. Microclimates are small areas of varying weather conditions within the larger zones, and they can be caused by local geography of the area, such as hills and valleys, and large bodies of water, as well as variations of solar and wind exposure. Even buildings and pavements in urban areas can create relatively small right, microclimates that can potentially produce different gardening results. Next slide. Here we go. So Canadian frost dates are arranged by region and include the final frost date of the spring season and the first frost date of the fall season. This suggests a period of time where you can safely set your plants out in your garden, ensuring them with an optimal growing temperature during both day and night. The Perry Sound area is listed as having a last frost date of May 31st and a first frost date of September 11. Microclimates do play their part. I cannot safely plant until after June 15th because my veggies are in an open field and are exposed to the wind. The frost hits my property hard in the spring. It hits hard in the open lowlands in the fall too, but up by my house or near warm rocks, the plants have more protection. Next slide. Oh, so you can see here, sorry, Perry Sound is May 31st to September 11th, but working with growing times and days to maturity. If I'm hoping that mother nature will be kind to my efforts, then I have by my records, June 15 to September 11 for relatively safe gardening time. That is 88 days. This information guides my seed selection by using the days to maturity. It is best for me not to pick anything that takes longer than 88 days to mature if I'm going to directly seed in the garden. I can start my plants and raise them indoors or use a greenhouse and that'll expend, extend growing season. And there are many ways to protect your plants from frost once in the ground, 
by purchasing or through innovation. I have purchased the Vessi's floating row covers. You can find those on page 140 of the catalog. And they work relatively well, provided the plants are small enough. I have also used bed sheets because I found that if a plastic covers, uh, covering touches the plants, that allows the frost in. And I've used a wide board to cover my seedlings, supporting them over firewood pieces in the spring. And I've also buried them, my seedlings if they sprouted up too soon, with the soil around them and with the use of sawdust. You can also use cardboard boxes, tin cans, pails, margarine tubs, anything will do in a pinch if you don't mind covering over at night, but removing them in the morning. Next slide. So if we go to that Vessi's catalog on page 65, we can look at Brandywine Organic tomato, Tomatoes, and it lists the standard for heirloom tomato flavor, well known for its size and exotic sweet tomato flavor. It is open pollinated, compact indeterminate growth habit produces large one pound fruit with pinkish red flesh. Maturity about 78 days and approximately 100 seeds per package. That means it's good for you and for sharing with the seed library. So this is loaded with words that may or may not mean anything to you. So let's go over them. Heirloom. Heirloom seed is open pollinated varieties, which are plants that are true to the first generation or parent from cultivars, which have been grown and passed down for generations. Open pollinated. These mean non-hybrid varieties that will breed true to the parents from one generation to the next. However, due to uncontrolled pollination by wind or insects, they can be more variable than hybrids. And that means you might not want more than one tomato variety in any given area to forgo a cross-pollination and the making of a hybrid by mistake. Indeterminate. Indeterminate plants are tall, requiring staking. They do produce tomatoes over a longer period of time. Instead of, how, instead of having one large harvest all at once, they bear over a period of months. And these are perfect for home gardeners who want their harvest spread out or for greenhouse growers that want tall plants to best utilize their uh, vertical space. So if you don't have an indeterminate, that means you might have a determinate, and that means it's a fine variety that grows to a certain height and that it will not require pruning or staking. Next slide. In the same Vessi's catalog, if we go to page 74, they give you a beautiful vegetable planting chart. And we'll just look at two examples. Tomatoes require eight to 10 days to germination. So you plant the seed, it'll take eight to 10 days for it to pop up. They suggest planting it six to eight weeks start ahead of time for transplant after frost. If you go by my estimate, which is June 15, that means that you can um, start them in mid-April to early May and then plant them June 15. Now looking at peppers, they take 14 to 20 days to germinate. So they're a slow start. And they suggest you start them eight to 20 weeks before transplant after frost. So again, using my scenario, that means you're going to start late January to mid-April for planting in mid-June. This Vessi's website has lots of good stuff. If you're on the website, you choose Gardening 101. It's one of the little bars at the top. And under that, go to download the growing guide and they give you all kinds of information on all kinds of plants and how to's. Let's go to the next slide. So changing out and coming to the Richter's catalog, if you turn to page eight under annuals and perennials, we've chosen basils. There's a lot of information here, but I want you to see a few important components. 
Under duration, the basils are listed as an annual, and that means that they will live one year and then die. So you have to seed every year. They're easy to germinate, so that's a good choice for beginners. They say Genovese is a great culinary variety as it does not bolt as quickly as other types, meaning it's going to take its time going to seed and giving you more basil leaves to harvest. I've already received one question regarding basils growing in the garden and wondering why they don't do so well. I think they had a heavy clay base soil. So what this says is basil is a warm weather annual and it thrives in well-drained fertile soil in full sun or partially shady location where it gets at least six to eight hours of sun every day. Basil grows best when it's guaranteed adequate drainage. That's not clay soil. And it's typically, uh, all, they do best in pots. So plant them in your pots or put them in a raised bed. Give them good airflow between the plants by adequate spacing because it is susceptible to fungal mold. In order to encourage a more branched and bushy plant, prune to just about the second set of leaves after they produce their first six leaves and then keep pruning back each branch to the first six to eight leaves. You can continue pinching back to harvest your re leaves regularly because every pinch back encourages new growth and you get to enjoy the fruits. They also suggest harvesting in the morning because the leaves contain the highest concentration of aromatic oils. Moving on to the next slide. We'll look at chives. This is found on page 16 of their catalog from 2021. And under duration, it says that chives are a perennial and they're hardy in zones three to nine. And that means that you wanna plant these where they can live forever. Also consider that they are very easy to germinate and that means and they will grow. You'll want to pick their purple flowers before they go to seed or you will have chives all throughout your garden and lawn. Next slide. Looking at moss curled parsley. The duration says it's a, a biennial and that it is hardy in zones six to nine. The biennial means it won't go to seed until its second year. And in zone six, that means it's rather tender for our area but I have successfully had parsley winter over because I provide it with really good mulching. Next slide. Having a look at rosemary, it's found on page 56 of the Richter's catalog. For duration, it's listed as a perennial, but it's hardy to zones eight to 10. That means it's an annual here, unless you bring it indoors but rosemary is not a happy camper for indoors. So you're going to have a very persnickety house guest. For ease of germination, it's listed as moderate. So this means it's maybe not a good choice for the beginner, but you can always buy plants at the nursery. Next slide. We're gonna have a look at French tarragon. It's another perennial in zones four to seven. And I personally have a six-year-old plant in my garden, but you'll see that it has no germination information. This plant is grown from propagation. That means to do a, a new plant, you have to take a clip off the branch end, very much like what you see here in this picture, trim back some leaves on the bottom end, almost to the stem, but leaving where they attach and you can use a rooting hormone and you simply dip it in the hormone, stick it in some dirt and it will regrow and make a clone of the mother. So that's propagation. Next slide. So here's Juliet's garden. And my big question is to fence or not to fence? That is a good question. In 2020, we had a fence because we had free range chickens, but that meant I couldn't have their help for bug control because they thought that my veggies were fair game too. 
We put the fence up to keep them out until nature proved too much for them. And so we gave them their own fenced in enclosure called Fort Clux. And that meant I didn't have to fence my garden anymore. So as you see in 2021, there's no fence around my garden, but we had a near miss with some moose that came in to investigate. Now, what we do is we build a barrier fence with aroma and we use human urine that we'll collect in a pail and water down and sprinkle around the outside edges on the lawn around the garden. And it keeps out <laughs> lovely things like groundhogs and deer and me on occasion. <laughs> but it works and I'm not going to complain. So next slide. Welcome to Libby's garden. Unfortunately, Libby had to excuse herself for this evening. She had some very important family matters to tend to, but she gave me the information she wanted to share with you. She wants you to consider with all gardens, you have to consider your family and friends. Just imagine if everyone you knew grew zucchini, but you can work together by trading seeds and planting ideas. Also consider the crops usually ripen when you're going on holiday. So giving away to friends and family might get them to harvest for you while you're gone. She also suggests investigating in processes for preserving like dehydrating, canning and freezing because obviously we all grow more than we need. And with regards to fences, she suggests a deer fence needs to be at least seven feet tall and make sure that the gate to the garden allows for your biggest bucket, wheelbarrow or tractor. No sense building the fence if you can't get your tools in. Also, she suggests for trellises, trees can work for squash and they look pretty cool. She plants squash in a manure pile, not too far from her pine trees. And then the tra she trains the long tendrils into the trees. She's had many people ask what crazy fruit that is growing in the pine trees. So she calls them pine squash. <laughs> she also purchases wire mesh like you might use in, um, if you're going to pour concrete cement and you put the rebar in and she'll buy the wire mesh that's six inch by six inch. It's three and a half feet wide and seven feet long. And she's taken it and rolled it into a tall trellis for pole beans. She's tied two pieces together to make a tent like trellis for her peas. And she's bent one in half for a small tent trellis for her cucumbers. Very handy. Next slide. So the hobbit that Libby is, she doesn't grow just regular things. She has wonders and oddities. And here she's got cucamelons and watermelon radishes. Cucamelons grow on the vine and they're about the size of a grape. But despite the name, they're not actually a hybrid of watermelons and cucumbers. They do have a semi-hard rind with markings like a watermelon, but the entire thing is totally edible. So you can pop them into your mouth for a burst of cucumber flavor with a sour twist packed with nutrients. They require full sun and hot weather, but you can still grow them even if your conditions aren't ideal. Start them indoors and plant them after your danger of frost is passed in well-drained loose soil. They're relatively drought and pest resistant and they're hardier than most varieties of cucumber. So that makes them a truly anyone can grow type of fruit. For the watermelon radish, they're also known as rose heart or red meat radish. And it looks like it's inside out. The outside color starts green, but it turns to bright white as the radish matures. And this radish is excellent as is in salads and even cooked like an Asian radish. This one does best in cool climates. So plant it early and then plant it again late for a fall harvest. Next slide. Korean Perilia and ground cherries. So for Korean Perilla, um, it has a very seductive minty apple lemon scent. And you can use it as a veggie fresh, as a wrap for rice and things like a sushi. You can have it blanched, 
in soups, stews, pickled in soy sauce. Roast the seeds and use them like sesame seeds. This plant has a very slow start, but once it got going, it made a really large plant that she had at the entrance by her kitchen so that she could just grab a few as she went. It's quite pretty with purple under the leaves and the seeds make a neat rattling sound in the winter. So the, in the wind, so it makes a really nice winter feature for your garden. For the ground cherries, they're not very well known, but they're easy to grow in the garden with minimal pest and disease problems. Their small yellow orange fruits have a sweet tart flavor similar to pineapple with a faint background of tomato. In fact, ground cherries are part of the same plant family as tomatoes, but despite the name, they are not closely related to cherries. The plants um, look like small sprawling shrubs with bright green leaves. They have toothed edges and they have little yellow flowers in the summer before bearing fruit in the late summer to early fall. And they're wrapped in a papery husk, much like another relative, the tomatillo. Plant them in the spring, they're an annual. They have a fast growth rate and they complete their life cycle in one season. Before planting, note that all plants of the ground cherry and the plants except the fruit are toxic to people and pets. So you might not want to have easy access to them. Raised beds and staking the plants works well. Cover under the plant with a ground cloth to help to reduce the dropped cherries because even though they're an annual, you will find that they have reseeded and overwintered in the garden and they make many, many more. Next slide. So to go to fruits, we've got hascaps and elderberries. Hascaps are also known as a honeyberry or blue honeysuckle berry. And it's an exciting new berry crop for Ontario, packed with antioxidants, bursting with a sweet tart blueberry raspberry flavor, the hascap is ideally suited for Ontario's growing climates and is suitable to zone two. The plants are extremely hardy and one of the first shrubs to bloom and produce fruit in the spring or late April, early to May, and even into June. There's multiple health benefits from this plant. However, cross-pollination is required to set the fruit. So you need to plant at least two plants that flower about the same time. They do actually suggest two different varieties. And in Vessies, they have uh, two varieties that go with, um, uh, they go together. And then there's three boreal varieties that they suggest going together, just to help you out with the timing of the blossoms. All right. So with the elderberries, Growing a series of berries of various varieties produces ongoing fruit. Hascaps are early, black and red currants come to fruit it later, about summertime. And then the elderberry is late August to September. But if you're going to plant elderberries, remember that they're the deer's absolute favorite food. So you need to keep them fenced off. Next slide. Libby's all about the fun part of gardening. So she wanted to share a few cartoons and I can speak to this one because I've done it. If I'd known it was going to be such a late spring, I would have never started my garden seeds indoors. <laughs> Next slide. This speaks to the fencing. The deer are coming in and reading the menu for the lunch today. <laughs> And of course, Libby would always say, I garden in the nude because it's a lot cheaper than a scarecrow. <laughs> Next slide. We can't forget that we live here in Northern Ontario next to the forest and we have lots of little friends. So you wanna get your plants in before they start. You don't wanna to have to be weeding while they're on. Everyone asks, is the snow in the forecast yet? And I haven't used the fan, but I wear a full net gear when I go to my garden. So <laughs> next slide. 
And this speaks to the fact that nothing will ripen until you go on holiday. <laughs> and somebody might come along saying, somebody's got to eat all those veggies. <laughs> Thank you, Libby, for your humor. Next slide. I'd like to welcome Jean Bottrell now to speak to her gardening efforts and what she's learned over the years. Good evening, everyone. My husband and I have a farm on Highway 520 at Maple Island. We've been planting a garden here for approximately 45 years. The soil in our garden plot consists of very heavy clay, which can present a number of gardening issues. We have a rather large garden, as you can see, which we plow and cultivate with a tractor. We have to be extremely careful not to work the ground too soon as it will compact like cement. The clay soil does not warm up as quickly in the spring as lighter soil might. So despite the fact that we would like to plant before black fly season, that is not always possible. One advantage of the clay soil is that on a dry year, it does tend to retain the moisture a little better than the lighter soil would. We do try to have the potatoes, peas and onions planted by the end of May if possible. Other seeds will germinate and grow much faster after the soil has warmed up and we are free from the frost danger. I do not start my own plants, but the tomato plants that I purchase are planted in the garden after the frost danger is over. Aside from tomato and cabbage plants that I purchase, the remainder of the garden is planted by seed. Pumpkin seeds are generally planted directly into a mound of manure and under good conditions will produce well. And you can see in the fore foreground of that picture, there's a couple of manure piles there with the pumpkin plants growing. <clears throat> Um, you can see that we have a rather large garden, so we plant the rows far enough apart to allow rototilling between them. We change the location of our planting every couple of years to help alleviate any pests that might be in a particular area of the garden. If you notice in the right foreground of the picture, we have planted the tomatoes and cabbage in an area covered by black plastic. We started this a number of years ago to eliminate some of the weeding and to help with moisture retention. We usually plant marigolds around the outer edge as they help with pe insect pest control. Apparently some insects do not like the smell of marigolds. Like everyone's garden, some years it produces better than others, but we can usually grow a sufficient supply of potatoes, peas, beans, carrots, tomatoes, and squash. The biggest issue that we have had in the past few years, not taking the weeds into consideration, has been an ongoing battle with cucumber beetles. They're a very tiny black and yellow striped insect that feed on the tasty new leaves of the cucumber, squash, and pumpkin plants. If not controlled, they can decimate the plants very quickly. Once the leaves have grown, larger, they no longer seem to be a threat, apparently only liking the tender leaves of the early plant. I do have a couple of tips that I would like to share with you. For many years, we had a problem with root maggots destroying the onions and cabbage. Tommy Johnson, who's a lifelong resident of Dunchurch, told me to sprinkle a little table salt along the row before planting the onion bulbs. Voila! no root maggots. I also sprinkle a little salt in the hole dug for my cabbage plant. Sprinkle the salt in, throw a bit of dirt over top, and then put the plant in. And again, no more root maggots. This would also work well for radish, which we find we can't grow in our heavy clay soil. <clears throat> I have also noticed that since we started growing the cabbage in the black plastic, we have not had a problem with the cabbage moth worms. No one likes to cut into a cabbage and find a crawly green worm. So I don't know if it's the plastic, the marigolds, or just a coincidence. If by chance you're contemplating growing horseradish, I would suggest you plant in an area far, far away from your main garden. 
Horseradish loves to be broken and separated and each little root will start a new plant. When we first started our garden, we were not aware of the horseradish growing in that area. And after being plowed and cultivated, it spread through the entire garden. And to this day, we continue our ongoing battle to get rid of it. Potato bugs can be a serious plague to a garden. We're not usually affected by them, but on some years we have had an infestation. We check the potato patch every day, and if we see any bugs, we knock them into a small container of diesel fuel or gasoline. It's important then to check the underside of the leaves for eggs and remove the leaves as well. Just another note about the clay soil. If you have a small garden plot of heavy clay, you could try adding peat moss, mulch, very small amount of sawdust, compost or manure, all of which will help to loosen the soil. Now, despite having a farm, our garden does not get manured very often, just due to the timing of when the manure is put out. It's usually spread on the fields in late summer and early fall when the garden is still growing. We do, however, use commercial fertilizer in small amounts as needed, often sprinkling it close to a row and prior to a rain. We find that that works well to keep everything growing well. So hope that these tips will be of some help and happy gardening. So this is just a slide with a compilation of favorite tools. There's a photograph there of, of my particular favorites and I have a trowel that has measurements on it so I know how deep I've dug the hole. That's especially important for bulbs and corms. I have a hand claw that is indispensable. Oh my goodness, that's like an extension of my own hand to get in and around the plants. Of course, you don't like to be down around all the plants with a garden the size that us we ladies grow. So I have um, uh, cultivators that I can use while I'm standing. There's a small one and a large one. And the large cultivator is a hand-me-down from many generations of families. I don't even know how old it is, but. I know it's seen three generations of gardeners and, and on it goes. Watering cans, uh, water tank with a hose, they're all indispensable. Stakes and strings are important to keep your lines straight. If you're like me, you don't really see straight. Supporting trellises, like Libby says, very important. I use a bucket for weeding because I share it as a seat, but you can get a garden kneeler, as you can see down there at the bottom, you can kneel on it or sit on it as a bench as well. Harvest baskets are very important because if you're going to pull out a bunch of stuff all at once, you're nice, nice to have a place to put it. Frost protection, indispensable here in the north. A hoe, which also helps you make sharp edges around your garden, as well as getting in around those uh, plants and taking out the weeds gloves because of course the, the uh, soil will dry your hands. Secateurs, I've spelt that wrong, it's very French, or pruners, also important especially if you have hardy plants like tomatoes and you need to just trim off a few branches that have gone haywire. Next slide. So let's have a bit of fun. We've got two games to play here. Name that weed and is it food? So there's 10 weeds and let's go with number one. If you guys want to type in chat, I guess I can follow there and see what your guesses are. No guesses? Oh, arugula, it is a weed. All right, so this weed has a name. I like to name things. If I can find out what their names are, I feel more personal with them and, and what to do with them. And so this one is known as field sorrel or sheet sorrel, red sorrel, even sour weed. So it's got lots of names. And as to the question, is it edible? Yes, it is. It's very sharp, uh, citric, 
it has like a lemony sharpness to it. I've eaten them. Great for salads. So if you look at number two, that would be on the left middle at the top. Any guesses on that one? Just to give you a hint, some people actually plant this and then find out later it wasn't such a good idea. We've got, yes, horseradish. It is horseradish. And these roots tend to run deep, but in this heavy clay soil, my horseradish, instead of growing deep, grew long. So I had a 15 foot long root that I horizontally dug up and took to the fall fair a couple of years ago. To, when we, our theme was our roots run deep because yes, it really would have <laughs> if it could have. And if you put horseradish in, you will be yours trying to take horseradish out. And yes, it's edible. How about number three, sort of the top middle right? <laughs> well, Melanie, you're almost right on eating all of them, but not quite. So number three is, is um, pigweed. It, it's in the amaranthus family. So it has a great big head with lots of fuzzy, uh, like a fuzzy flower and it produces lots of seeds that you could actually mill into flour. And yes, it's edible. So taking a look at number four, any guesses there? That one is called purslane. It's kind of rubbery. If anybody's ever grown a jade plant, it's kind of like that. Little yellow flowers on it and you can pick it forever and you'll still always have more. But it is also edible. It's in the Portulaca family in case you thought you recognized it. Going on to plant number five, I'm sure everybody knows what that one is. It's really good in the lawn. Yes, it's a dandelion. <laughs> good for bees and good for everyone. You can use every single part of the dandelion for all kinds of things, including reducing your blood sugar. Yes, it does make great jelly and wine. <laughs> and you can use it as greens to make um, Italian wedding soup. My mom made pasta with it. You can use the flowers to bake in cookies and muffins. It's fantastic stuff. All right. So, and you can eat it. Yes. Number six. Everybody knows what that is. So that's the Shasta Daisy, pretty wild around here. But you can take those flowers and put them in a salad. Who knew? Number seven. Yep. Yes, it's red clover. And that tells you it's an indicator for what kind of soil you have. And it usually means alkaline. It is good. We put it, we use it for teas and the blossoms are lovely put in salads as well. And what about number eight? Here's a tricky one. Who knows that one? Looks like a wild snapdragon, right? Not a flux glove. Well, I'll help you out. It's got a tricky name. It's called toad flax. <laughs> and it's actually not recommended for consumption because it has some kind of chemical in it that's really not good for your blood. And it's actually toxic to horses. So who would? How about nine? Everybody knows that one.
bottom left corner there. It is more clover. This one's a white clover and it has a, a vanilla notes to it if you wanted to add it to things. Um, so it's, it's part of the trifoliums or the three leaves family. And last but not least, number 10 over there in the bottom right corner. Maybe the picture isn't doing it justice. That one's a bull thistle. I get a lot of these in my garden. And believe it or not, it's edible. Very carefully edible. But here's a caution. Just because you can eat it doesn't mean that you should eat it because allergies can come to, into play and lots of nature is actually medicine. And you don't take med medication if you don't need it. So just walk with caution. So on to the next slide. One more game, name that test. Any guesses on number one? Jane, you'll know what this one is. For sure, Juliet, it's the cucumber beetle. And not your friend, right? <laughs> you bet. Still don't know how to get rid of it. How about number two? I believe it's also a cucumber beetle, just with different markings. Smarty pants. <laughs> yes, it is. Any guesses on number three? Everybody have a, take a close look at the leaf that it's on. That might even give you a hint. Gypsy moth. Yeah, no, not quite. It's on a cabbage leaf. So this one's actually an imported cabbage worm, imported cabbage worm. What do you think about number four? I think the moth part looks more like a gypsy moth, but this one is also a cabbage issue or the brassica family and it's called a cabbage looper. And I guess that's because it makes that inchwormy kind of thing when it's a worm. How about number five? Any guesses? Yes, Sheila, you are so right. So that's a potato larva, icky gicky thing. And the right side picture has the actual beetle with a bunch of eggs. And the only way I know how to get rid of them effectively is to squish all the little blighters between my fingers, eggs and all. It's not 100%, but it gets the job done. So moving on to number six, does anybody recognize that ugly little bed, bed fell on the left? It's chicken food, yes it is. <laughs> And I was hoping, my, yes, you got it. It's a tomato hornworm. Beautiful little moth though, isn't it? And last but not least, we have a trick question. We have two larvae, 7A and 7B, and one adult moth, 7C. So the first question is, does A go with C or does B go with C? And then the second question, and it's multiple is, what do you think all of these colors are? That's uh, okay. I left the toughest for last. Hungry jerks. Yes, they are. <laughs> so 7B is a corn borer. 7C. Nope. But good guess. It was a 50 50. 
7B is actually a corn borer worm. And if you've ever grown corn, they're your nemesis. And 7C is their adult moth. Pretty looking thing with white legs. And 7A is actually the larva for the cucumber beetle. So that brings us all the way back up to number one. Thanks all for playing. And now Beth Gorham Matthews is going to talk to you about what she does over at the farm. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is a photo of our garden. We actually have a farm um, down the Washkesh Road that's been in my family for a long time. The, this garden's been in this location for uh, quite a few years. Um, so we, because we have a pretty big garden as well as Jane, we use a tractor and a rototiller. Um, to do all the prep work on our garden as well. And we use the rototiller to weed in between the rows. In the fall, uh, we do uh, prep work in terms of rototilling once we've taken off the last of the um, crops. So our late crops would be pumpkin and squash and carrots. We'll dig up carrots right even after it started to snow, even if the, the tops are frozen. The carrot is still good in the ground and we'll keep eating them right until the very end. Um, so once a little bit of snow is on and the ground is frozen, we'll put a, a layer of manure over the garden. And just over the winter, that lets the snow um, work with it and it slowly dissolves into the ground. It's a nice and slow addition. We also like to add ashes to our garden as well, sparingly. Um, ashes contain lime and potassium um, that enriches your garden. Um, depending on the type of firewood you burn, hardwood has uh, a lot more nutrients in it than uh, softwood. So if you're concerned about what type of soil you have and what nutrients you think you need to enrich, you can get your soil tested. We've done it before. Um, there's a place in Guelph, I think it's through OMAF or the University of Guelph, um, you can take a sample of your ground and they'll analyze it and tell you what uh, you should add to it. This area tends to be low in lime, so we find adding a little bit of ash every year to the garden helps to work it up. Um, if you want to go to uh, the next slide. So I, had, I saw this on Facebook back in the beginning of January. Um, and I had a good laugh at it because I do all of these things at one point during the year. So it says your New Year's resolutions. Uh, we're going to fail to keep on top of the weeds. That was a good picture of my garden. I'll be honest. <laughs> there are times it doesn't look like that. Um, you know, where, you know, you get busy haying and all the other stuff by August. Sometimes things get away on you. But um, I buy plants I don't have room for all the time. Um, Asked my husband how many tomato plants we end up with. It's never good. <laughs> I buy more seeds than I'll ever sow, but I love my garden with all its imperfections. So, you know, really, this cartoon it just, you know, emphasizes that you know you can have fun with your garden and not take it too seriously. Um, it's like any hobby uh, that you can enjoy. So, what we always do here, um, this is a a map of what we do in 2021. So normally we will um, have a map like this for every year. That way we can make sure that we rotate our plants each year and we're not growing the same thing in the same patch of soil each time. And I'll touch a bit on this in the next slide. A couple things from this picture that I'll note. Um, if you're growing anything perennial, you want to grow it off to the side so that if you're rototilling your garden, you're not going to be having to always work around it. We have a, a strawberry patch at the bottom there. And we also have a rhubarb patch. So those things are off the beaten trail a bit, still in the garden area. So we're still able to look after them while we're out in the garden. But at the same time, we're not having to work around them all the time. So 
strawberries and rhubarb are great perennials because you can plant them and they'll come back every year. You get to enjoy them. You can freeze them as well if you can't eat everything um, through the summer. Also along the side, we have um, a greenhouse there. So we'll talk about the greenhouse in another slide. Uh, you can see just beside the greenhouse that we have our rows of garlic. We usually grow 50 to 60 uh, cloves of garlic. We love garlic. Um, the other thing, we do that so that when we're working the rest of the garden in the spring, we're not having to go around the garlic. The garlic you're going to plant in the fall, and then we cover it with straw. You want to plant it as late in the fall as you can without having the snow already come in. So we wait until you know, close to the end of October, and then we'll plant our uh, garlic in the spring. As it starts to poke its little heads up out of the ground, we'll uncover the straw a bit around each plant to help them come up. But you really want to keep your garlic well weeded. They will grow best when they're not having to compete with weeds. The great thing about garlic too is in July, you can harvest the scapes off of them. And we use the scapes, we'll pickle them, then we have them all winter and we will also use them and uh, fry them up and put them in different foods like in eggs and things. It's really good. So you get to enjoy the garlic and the, and the scapes as well. Um, so when planting as well on my map here, I will kind of um, group things together that have similar watering needs. So you can see the big patch in the, the one corner there. I have all my squash and watermelon and pumpkins and cucumbers, zucchinis all things that require a little bit more um, care to take care of and that way we're carrying water just to certain sections of the garden each time and we do use a lot of water because we have a really big garden so we have um, barrel set up on a wagon and then we'll go down to the river and use a sump pump to fill up our barrels and then we just have to fill them up once a, once a week so do you want to go to the next slide Well, this, this just go, come and goes over the science of why you want to map and rotate your garden. Um, you'll prevent disease from building up in some areas. There's certain um, insects and things that will, will accumulate in areas if you keep putting the same plant in there each time. So it helps you to control insects. Uh, one thing, if you get a lot of um, potato bugs, you can kind of prevent that by moving your potatoes around in your garden. If you put them in the same spot all the time, they will find your potatoes. So I haven't had potato bugs, thank goodness. But I remember when as a kid, that was a chore that nobody liked to have, where you had, you're had you given a jar and you had to just go out to the garden and pick bugs off the plate, potato plants. So <laughs> I don't want to do that, and I don't want to do that to my children. <laughs> uh, so nutrient balance, different plants need different nutrients. So if you rotate... Um, your, your uh, plants around, then they're not going to draw the same nutrients out of the soil each year. We also do cover crops. Um, of, they recommend oats or clover. We do oats. Um, so if we have a section, any sections that we didn't get to planting or that we're not going to use that year or sometimes in between rows, we'll put down oats. And when you kill that over in the fall, that adds a lot of nutrients to you your soil. So you can't um, keep growing and harvesting off the same soil every year and not, not give something back to it. It needs, needs the nutrients um, to keep it healthy. Uh, next slide, please. So we do start a lot of our plants indoors. Um, a lot of pumpkins, squash, watermelon. Um, this year we did cucumelons for fun. We're always trying different things just to make it interesting. So we have a great big garbage bag of cups and old containers in our basement that I always throw them in. We're always reusing things. Um, and we'll keep old baskets, like the big baskets from hanging baskets, because sometimes, uh, like that one cartoon from Libby where you planted them too early in the spring, they will outgrow these cups and then you will need to transplant them into a bigger pot or they will get root bound before you're able to um, get them into the ground. 
Next slide. So we do have a greenhouse for Lucky. Uh, it's not a traditional greenhouse. I'm married to uh, a red green type fella and he likes to repurpose things. So this is an old carport uh, type that has the tarp on the outside and the tarp had gotten all ripped up from the wind over the years and the person was throwing it out at the dump. So we recycled it and my husband built door frames and frames for it and windows and things. And we covered it with greenhouse plastic. So we will move our plants that we had in our sunroom there in the cups out there once the danger of frost or snow has passed because it still will get cool in there in cool weather, even with the plastic on there. Um, I'll just mention that when you're starting things indoors and when you're going to move them to your greenhouse and then to your garden, you need to harden them before they make the permanent move. So what that means is you want to move them to the location that they're going to for a few hours every day before you make the permanent move. It'll give them a chance to get used to that climate and um, different weather conditions. When they're going to move outside, they need to be used to the wind. Otherwise, they'll, they'll get broke right over. Their stalks aren't strong enough. So. I've not done that before, so that has happened where we rush it. We're like, oh, we're just going to put it straight in the garden, and it doesn't work. <laughs> so, um, in the summertime, once all these other plants that were in the cups go out, we do keep things year-round in the greenhouse. Not year-round, but for the rest of the summer. We'll grow tomatoes, our peppers, celery, um, all grow well in our greenhouse. We also have kale and spinach and lettuce in the greenhouse from April till November. So I use that a lot in smoothies. And then if there's an abundance, because kale can take off and get away on you, I'll just clip all the extra leaves and I freeze them in little baggies to use in my smoothies as well. So um, then the other thing with the greenhouse, whenever you are leaving things in there for the summer, it can get super hot and humid in there. And we found uh, that our tomatoes would start to get rot, like little black spots of rotting on the bottom of them. And that was from it being too hot and humid in there. So from about mid-July on, we'll roll up the sides of the greenhouse. So it's still humid and warm, but not quite so um, tropical. So next slide, please. So I just wanted to briefly mention companion planting. It's part of um, your mapping when you're planning where you're going to put all your rows of, of vegetables. And I'm sure you can find some good books about this at the library and get into it more in depth. Um, but companion planting helps your soil and can manage weeds, can help ward off pests by pairing certain vegetables together and attract some beneficial insects by um, choosing certain plants to go with each other. So an example, um, would be tomatoes and cabbage close but not too close. They compete for the same nutrients, but tomatoes will repel the moth larvae that chew holes in the, in the cabbage. So putting them closer together but not right beside each other will uh, hopefully, they say, prevent getting uh, moth. I've never had anything chew my cabbage yet, so I don't know if that's what I'm doing or if I'm just lucky. Uh, another good idea. Um, in terms of companion planting is planting cucumbers where you had your beans and peas the year before. The bees and peas, uh, peas release a lot of nitrogen in the soil and cucumbers love that. So the next year, once all the, you've worked the dead plants into the ground in that area, if you planted your cucumbers there the next year, they will really thrive in that area. Uh, another example would be putting squash and corn and beans together. You've all heard of three sisters. So the corn acts as a climbing pole for the beans. The beans add nitrogen to the soil and the squash leaves planted around the corn and the beans help to reduce weeds and keep the soil moist. So they grow well together. But you know, you can do your own research and there's a lot of, um, a lot of things that will work well together. And that's part of you know, deciding where you're gonna put everything before you actually get out into the garden. Uh, next slide. 
So another aspect of um, the companion garden is you can grow flowers in your, your garden as well. We love to grow sunflowers. They, um, we probably had 50 sunflowers this year. Uh, and they'll attract bees to your garden. Birds love them at the end of the season as well, you know, to get their winter feed in. Uh, but you can also plant uh, flowers that are beneficial, like geraniums can sometimes repel beetles, and marigolds will repel beetles, and um, tomato hornworms. Um, and rabbits don't like marigolds, so they've some places will recommend it. Some books will say you can plant the edge of marigold around the outside of your garden and make uh, keep the rabbits out. <laughs> we get some rabbits in our garden. Um, there's some of the books I was looking at will recommend lavender and things like that. The only thing I will um, say about the flowers is if you're going to choose something that's not an annual, make sure it's something that isn't going to spread and take Oops. over the rest of your garden. Uh, you don't want to uh, solve one problem and create a different problem. <laughs> uh, so choose with care, I would say. Yeah. Um, next slide. Yeah, so I just, I, I'm like Libby, I like to laugh about things too. So uh, this one says, I planted peas, carrots, corn, onions, tomatoes, lettuce, string beans, pumpkins, and watermelons. And he has this little garden about four feet by four feet. So, and you know what, I bet something grows. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, it's about having fun. It's about trying new things and, you know, feeding your family at the same time. So, thank you. Thank you, Beth. And now it's time for Q&A. Do we have any questions? If you want to type them in chat, I'll keep an eyeball there. And if you want to unmute, you can ask your question and we'll do our best to answer. Okay, we've got tomatillos. I had that question earlier and I suggest you ask here. So thank you very much. And long beans. Um, I've grown long beans or the, the oriental beans, asparagus bean type thing, and they did really well. You just wanna make sure that they get a good start. Uh, I had a really long season the first year I grew them. So they were great and I had a good crop. And tomatillos, I've never really grown them. But since Libby can do the ground cherries, I'm sure tomatillos will be about the same. Uh, you just want to give them a good head start, perhaps in a dish in the house to begin with. Oh, Beth, here's a question for you. Do carrots pair with potatoes? And what time of what type of oats to till into the soil? So we, we just buy our oats from uh like stick and stone, finchum, any place like that. Uh, if you wanted to split on a bag with someone, they come in quite a large bag. Um, mm. Probably more than the average uh, garden would need. And yeah, we just buy them from the feed store and, and plant them. Uh, I'm not sure about the uh, um, pairing of, of uh, potatoes and carrots stuff. Check. I know, I know that carrots love potatoes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Just that they, come, they fight each other's bugs. A and I like to grow my carrots alongside my radishes in the same row because the radishes will grow and you harvest them. But in the growing, they sort of force the carrots to spread out. And so then the carrots aren't too packed. It's worked well for me. White zone is actually zone 4A, but we have 3B tendencies. So out my way, I'm not Maple Island way, so we're running into 3B actually, uh, but just because of my open plain area. If I was closer to a body of water, like White Stone Lake, it might actually remain a solid four. Um, someone else was asking about topsoil and, and where to get topsoil. We've got a lot of aggregate places around here that you can ask for help there. Quite often they'll have topsoil or even triple mix. Triple mix is a good idea. 
tomato transplants. Well, I got some really good ones from uh, the Magneto on Home Hardware last year. I was in a pinch, everything got frosted off again. Um, but I know that uh, little, is it Little Gardens in Perry Sound? They have an, a wonderful supply of all kinds of things as well. You can, Richter's actually sells tomatoes in 12 packs. So you can share with a friend so you don't get too many of, of one and place an order there. You, if you picked up your catalog from the library, you just check it out and see which kind of tomato you want to grow. You could, last year they had um, organic tomatoes at that, uh, was it Beaver Creek Farm down McKellar Center Road? They were selling, uh, they were selling um, transplants of different vegetables last year and we got some tomatoes there. So Eve has also awesome. mentioned there's lots of, orga of the organic tomato seeds at the library. Um, we've also found for people that are near to Perry Sound, places like Walmart and um, yep. Canadian Tire and, and the Depot. Farmer's Market. If you want to support a smaller business, the Farmer's Market in town also sells uh, tomato plants. Yes. I'll just say that if you're going to plant tomato seeds, you should start them indoors earlier because if you planted a tomato seed outside, by the time the plant got big enough, uh, you probably wouldn't have any tomatoes by the mm -hmm. time the frost come. Eva? True that. Is Eva still here with yes. us? Yes, I'm still here. Eva, would you just uh, take a couple minutes and tell the group about the seed li library? For sure. Uh, so if you, if you guys aren't familiar with the seed library, it was started with the Agricultural Society at the Whitestone Public Library. So um, in the library, there is a big collection of seeds. I think we've got over 300 varieties of seeds in the library. And the idea is they're free to take, but then when you go to harvest your uh, crops, you save seeds from those and then return them to the library. And if you if you weren't able to get any seeds, you can also donate um, just regular commercial seeds back to the library as well, if you have any extras after you've done your orders. And then other people can use those seeds. And what other helpful reference do you have at the library there, Eva? <laughs> we have a whole <laughs> lot of books. <laughs> We have a lot of, uh, we've, we've really expanded our collection of uh, gardening books and seed planning books and seed saving books at the library. Uh, we've included a few pages in your packages that you can pick up at the library, um, pages for garden planting and on zones and that kind of thing. And we'll be adding to those binders that we gave out for, for part of this program throughout the year for the upcoming programs. So the, the Agriculture Society did have a special last year for se saving seeds in our competition, and I'm hoping that uh, this year we can add that as well, that part of the fair competition will be seeds. Yeah. We will be having a workshop on how to save seeds, likely um, in August we'll be holding that workshop with the Agricultural Society. So there's a question about rhubarb. Does any, are any of you good rhubarb people? When should you I'm plant a new rhubarb? Sure I don't know about starting a new patch, but if you go to that Vessi's catalog, they do sell uh, rhubarb starts. So you could even ask them. And in that gardening 101 link that I suggested, I'm sure that they do have lots of information. Um, yeah, I, and I don't even know how to keep rhubarb sustained up here because I plant, I brought some and it grew for two years and then it perished. And Velma Greer, my good friend down the road, had a beautiful rhubarb patch and it also perished. So I can't explain what happened, but, but we had a devastation of rhubarb up here on Maple Island. Um, so I would suggest going to Vessi's unless somebody else here has good experience with rhubarb and starting patches. Okay, and we also had some earlier questions about turnips. A couple of people were referencing growing turnips in the area. Has anyone successfully grown them from our gardeners? 
Mm. I can answer that in a sec. Jane, were you going to speak to rhubarb? Yes, um, I was given some rhubarb roots a couple of years ago, and we planted them just in one corner of the garden, and they're doing really well. Um, we didn't harvest anything from them the first year, and um, last year the plants just really exploded. So hopefully they'll be all right this year as well. And we did um, cut off all the the leaf and and what was left before winter, so that um, it wasn't going to you know, have to work its way through that come spring. So we're looking for a good crop again here. Excellent. Um, with regards to turnips, I had a really good surprise. I've never grown them before and I had a really good year, lots of good turnips, but I had a worm infestation. So I'm going to do it again this year with Jane's suggestion for the, the black plastic down on the ground to maybe ward that off and using some salt. Uh, I figure it's just, you get the right year or you have the wrong year and you just keep trying. Don't plant too many all at once, but you've got seeds, you can just keep trying. I don't know what else to suggest on um, turnips. Somebody was asking about container gardening. We're going to be doing some container gardening next month in, in February. We're going to be, uh, we've got uh, 20, hopefully more than 20, hopefully we've got 24 uh, windowsill gardens that people can pick up kits from at the library. Uh, but in any, any event, the talk will be good. And we're going to talk about biochar and things that you can do to enhance life in a container garden because it's not quite the same as growing in, in live dirt on the ground you have to sort of provide everything that nature would have given these plants inside the box so that'll be fun so do tune in in february and maybe we'll have some information that uh speaks to you then and we also should maybe comment about our raised beds project that we're going to have at in at the library oh yes so this will be a wonderful learning uh, curve for all of us, including me, because we want to do raised beds, but uh, I think it would behoove us all to bring in a permaculture attitude. So that means starting with um, laying down logs and sticks and leaf mulch and old dried up weeds and things and using cardboard and compost and dirt and mulch on top and letting that become a permanent culture for a garden so that it requires a lot less work, a lot less weeding, a lot less feeding. Um, hopefully it maintains its own moisture and heat, but we'll see. So I guess what I was hinting at is one of our other initiatives that we've also received grant money for is building the raised beds at the library, which will be starting this spring. Maybe we could share a little bit about that. Well, sure. So the hope is, well, our project is to build eight raised beds. We want at least two of them to be wheelchair accessible, but hopefully we can make more so. And uh, through that project, we're going to be initiating um, soil studies, compost studies. We want to get the kids involved. They have soil testing kits. So we want them to come in and teach us all how to test for soil content and what you need to do to amend the soil to make it more uh, hospitable for your plants. And um, that'll be an ongoing thing throughout the year. By the end of year two, which would be about February 2023, we'll have all eight beds in place and we'll be waking, waiting for spring to wake up and we'll start the seminar process again, I hope. And um, that might be the initiative for all kinds of things regarding um, environmental stewardship and permaculture and food uh, diversity and food sustainability, everything. You name it, we can throw it into this little pot of goodies. <laughs> and that's the main state of the project. Yeah, I'll also just... Um... Some topics that we'll be talking about throughout this year, um, planned workshops that we have. Uh, so in May, we'll be talking about soil and that's um, soil testing, remediation, fertilizing and compost. Uh, in June, we're gonna be talking about um, preserves, how to do preserves and herb saving. Uh, July is gonna be weeds and weeding. August is gonna be seed saving as a topic, as well as fair prep in case we're interested in that. 
In September, we're going to be talking about how to put your garden to bed, planting garlic and other bulbs. In October, we're going to be talking about raised bed gardens, because those will be up by then. And in November, we're going to be talking about seed saving in the seed, si seed library. Now, these uh, dates are still soft dates for these upcoming workshops, um, these months, but and topics. And we can always add to them as you guys have questions as well. Eva, someone was asking if you need volunteers to help with the Raised Beds project. I am confident we do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, so interactive with the raised bed building and planting and caregiving. We're hoping that the whole community wants to come in and take part. And then, of course, there's the harvesting as well and making use of the produce. So, again, volunteers, come on in and help yourself. But, um, Eva, you're the head of the library, so you get to sort of monitor what goes on there. And um, Pauline wants to know if we can speak about native plants to attract and feed wildlife. I'm fairly certain that's going to be part of one of our seminars. We're hoping to partner with Perry Sound Friendship uh, Center. And um, oh, Lisa has lots of experience digging potatoes. You're hired. <laughs> <laughs> So this is certainly uh, um, forming itself as we go. And everything that you're asking for is definitely part of what we want to do. Okay, so uh, do we have any more questions? Because we do have another short presentation. So the last little bit that we're going to talk about here, if anybody picked up a kit at the library, it will have contained some popcorn. So popcorn, we all know, uh, starting it in the pot or a popcorn popper makes a nice light slack, snack, but microgreens is a fun way to bring spring into January and to bring flavor and nutrition to the table all year long. And I've had the most fun with popcorn because I was surprised to learn that if you use your popcorn kernels as seeds, they'll grow. So using a container with a clear lid, that allows you to turn it into a mini greenhouse to start your seeds, no matter what microgreen you choose. So I place several layers of paper towel into the bottom of my tray and I soak them well and I sprinkle the seeds on top. So next slide. The seeds are happiest when they're surrounded by moisture. And you can see here that I used vermiculite, but that's because I'm lazy and I don't wanna dig them out of the dirt and wash them. You can also use soil. Once you put the lid on top, you keep the container in a warm area. So I've used the top of my refrigerator, but I also have a space in my basement where I can let them sit on the top of my ductwork and they get a nice, nice warm toes. And in a few days, next slide, they begin to sprout and the uh, green part on top gives you a burst of super sweet corn flavor. And I like to graze on them right from the dish, but you can also throw them in a salad. Don't put the kernels in though, they're a little crunchy. So for the next slide, I tried a second batch with just more paper towel on the top. You could use toilet paper too because uh, not everybody has vermiculite or topsoil kicking around the house. And guess what? That did the job too. So the next slide shows you how they grew. Three days they're sprouting. Five days, well, they've gone a bit past what I'd like to eat. So my chickens got to eat them. So bon appetit, cluck clucks. Um, if you want to go back to your Vessi's catalog, if you look on page 35, they talk about microgreens. And on page 58, they talk about sprouts and shoots. So that tells you what I know, not much. They're all the same to me. But you can have a look 
and discern for yourself what you'd like to grow. There's all kinds of things that you can try. Just fantastic fun for January, just to beat those blues. So for the next slide, I wanna thank everybody very much for attending our first seminar and thank you for supporting our grassroots growth initiative. And please come back again. I think Eva, is, did you wanna say again what's coming up or did you outline that already? Yeah, I can do that. Um, so we've got, our next session is gonna be in February. We're gonna talk about herb container gardens and Juliet is gonna do that. Uh, we've got some funding from the Georgian Bay Biosphere to provide uh, these workshops for February and March. And then March, we're gonna do um, starting annuals indoors. April, currently we have nothing happening. Uh, in May, again, it's soil testing, remediation and fertilizer and compost. June, we're gonna be talking about preserves, um, canning and herb saving, dehydrating and other ways to save your veggies once you harvest them. We're gonna be talking about uh, weeds, weeding, seed saving, uh, putting your, gar your garden to bed, garlic and bulbs, raised bed gardens, and then uh, the seed library as well. So yes, if you do have questions or more ideas for workshops for this program, please let us know and we can add them to our topics that we'll be discussing throughout the next two years. <laughs> <laughs>